So when position changes, that's what velocity measures. When velocity changes, that's what acceleration measures. What about when acceleration changes? Well, it turns out that in many situations physically, acceleration is essentially constant. Things like gravity and friction supply constant accelerations. And that special case, the case of constant acceleration, is what we're going to focus on now to come up with some relationships between position, velocity, acceleration. Let's write down what happens when the acceleration is constant. We'll start just with our acceleration here being some constant number. We don't know what it is just now. And that means it's going to equal our average acceleration. Now, you might have noticed I've left the little arrows off the top. We've got to keep in mind that these things are vector quantities. But for simplicity's sake, and because we're mostly going to be dealing in one dimension, I'm going to leave those arrows off for the time being. So if our acceleration is the same as our average acceleration, I can simply write it down as the change in velocity divided by the change in time. And now we're going to have a change in some of our symbols. Remember I said at the very start of the module, it's important we keep track of what symbol is standing for what. For simplicity's sake, there's some standard ones we'll change these two now. For example, our initial time we will call 0. That's when we're starting our stopwatch, the start of our time interval. And then we'll call our final time simply t. Our initial velocity we'll write down as v with a subscript 0, v0 our velocity at time 0. And our final velocity will simply then be v, our velocity some time later. We can now write our equation for acceleration down now as being our change in velocity, that is our final minus our initial, divided by our change in time, our final minus 0. So that's it. And now if we rearrange this equation, which is fairly straightforward to do, I can write this as my velocity is my initial velocity plus my acceleration multiplied by time. And this little expression here, which simply came out of our definition for acceleration, is our first equation of motion for constant acceleration. It's very useful. It links acceleration, velocities, and time. So let's try an example using it. We'll try an example where you're in your car, you're moving along at 20 meters per second, that's about 72 kilometers an hour, and you approach a red traffic light, you want to slow down and stop. Turns out that when you put the brakes on, you slow down with an acceleration of 4 meters per second squared. So the question we might like to ask is, how long does it take to slow down and stop? Now, a very important point in physics is to look at the words and descriptions that you're given and figure out what quantities do you know? What are the important quantities in the problem here? So we can figure out from this that our initial velocity, v0, is 20 meters per second. Our final velocity, that's when we've come to rest, is going to be 0. Our acceleration is 4 meters per second squared, they've told us. But importantly, if we're moving in the direction towards the traffic light, if that's the direction of our velocity, then in fact our acceleration must be in the opposite direction if we're going to slow down. And that's why we've got this minus sign here. It's very important that our acceleration is in the opposite direction. That's what makes us slow down. And we don't know what the time is. But we can now use our equation of motion to say that our velocity will be our initial velocity plus acceleration multiplied by time. And we can rearrange that algebraically. It's good practice for you uh, to find that our time is going to be v minus v0 divided by acceleration. And now we can put our numbers in. v here was 0, that's because we stopped, minus our initial, which was 20, divided by our acceleration, which was minus 4. So we've got 0 minus 20 divided by minus 4, which you can hopefully see is going to be 5 seconds. It took five seconds to slow down. Importantly, if we'd had the acceleration as positive, we would have got a negative time here, which would have made no sense at all. And it's also worth checking five seconds sounds about the right time to slow down for a traffic light. It's not five hours or five milliseconds. It kind of makes sense. Now, let's come up with another equation of motion, but this time thinking about the velocity and the displacement. Again, we can write down now that our average velocity here is, remember from our definition, our change in displacement divided by our change in time. It turns out for constant acceleration that our average velocity is also just the average of our initial and final velocities. So we can write that down as half the sum of our initial and final velocities.
Now, I already know how to write down my final velocity from the equation of motion that we just came up with a little bit earlier. This is going to be now v naught plus a t. This velocity up here becomes v naught plus a t. Then I'm going to add the v naught that I already had, and now I can make this quite simply v naught plus a half times a times t. That's going to be my change in displacement divided by my change in time, but remember that's just t, because t zero is, is zero. Now my change in displacement I can write down as v naught t plus a half a t squared. And this in fact becomes my second equation of motion for constant acceleration. This one's useful because it tells me how my displacement changes with velocity and acceleration and time. So let's try an example of this. We'll go back to the example we had before of our car stopping at the traffic light. This time we've already calculated the time involved. We're going to find out how far it travels before it comes to rest. And we can use our new equation of motion straight away. We know that our change in displacement is going to be our initial velocity multiplied by time plus a half the acceleration times the time squared. And now let's put our numbers in. This is 20 as our initial velocity. Five seconds is how we calculated it took, plus a half. Remember that our acceleration here is minus four times our time squared. And 20 times five is 100. And you should be able to calculate that a half times minus four times 25 there is going to give us minus 50. So our final result here is that it took 50 meters for the car to slow down. Again, a very useful relationship. Now we can take those two equations of motion that we had just before, one for velocities and times, this one for displacements and velocities and times, and we can actually combine them algebraically and get rid of the time variable. And that gives us a third equation of motion. And when you list all three of those together, you get three equations of motion in one dimension for constant acceleration. Very useful ways to describe how things are moving, to predict how things will move. In fact, when you're driving your car, you're making these calculations all the time. How fast do I need to slow down? How far will I go before I slow down? How fast do I need to speed up? These are things you do naturally, uh, but now we can do them explicitly and actually be quite powerful in our, in our physical interpretation of motion. What we're going to do in the next topic is think about what causes these changes in motion.